this is, this is, this is. Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Mike Herrera. Great to be here. Um, MXPeaks.com, if you haven't checked it out, we have some dates coming up. July 1st, we'll be at Festivois in Quebec at Three Rivers. That's uh, the English version, but uh, Trois Rivières, however you say that. Festival is a punk rock festival. It is going to be amazing. It's punk rock weekend, so join us. Uh, you can get tickets online. Go find it. Um, but MXPeaks.com is the place. Of course, we're going to be in September the 22nd. We'll be in Birmingham, Alabama for Furnace Fest. This is going to be an insane show. You don't want to miss it. If you have any inkling you might want to travel south, come on down. Come and see us. I promise you're going to be fine. You're going to have a good time. Uh, and then... Uh, October 22nd, 22nd and 23rd, I think. It's two shows in Las Vegas, Cal uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, not California. Sorry, my uh, my geography is not up to par right now. Uh, I've got to update my, my geography software. Um, it's in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it's at the When We Were Young Fest. We'll see you there. going to be awesome. There will be some, some new announcements before that time, of course. But until then, well, you know, for this podcast anyway... Um, go check out mxpeaks.com. Thanks for all your help. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for all your love and your kindness and your understanding. We really, we really appreciate it. If you want to call in and leave a message, the number is 360-830-6660. Tell me what you want to talk about, what you want to hear about. We'll get into it. Maybe you need some life advice, some love advice. Maybe I'm not your best bet on that, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. I wrote the song, Do Your Feet Hurt, you know? with uh, some pretty good pickup lines in there that I did not make up. Anyway, <laughs> let's get to this podcast. Dave Lake, Diesel Boy, Diesel Dave, you might know him as. Diesel Boy has a new album coming out July 28th. It's called Gets Old. We talk all about that. We talk, this, this one gets pretty deep on just <clears throat> life and being in, in a band and being an artist and, and being a writer and all of this stuff. Things that people, just everyday people, not that you listening are an everyday person, but what I mean is people that aren't in a band or aren't an artist or whatever, people like that will still be able to relate to this because it's great. Sorry, I'm going a million miles an hour. I don't even drink coffee. I don't know. I just, I'm going crazy. I love it. Um, this was a great conversation. Let's get into it. Here's Dave Lake. Dave Lake, welcome. Diesel boy. Uh, it's been a minute. We see each other kind of in passing through the years. How have you been? Uh, good. Busy. Like you, I got kids and, you know, a job and uh, trying to balance the, the band in there again, too. Uh, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been wild. It's been a busy, like, year and a half, two years trying to get this going again. We tried, we tried several years ago. Uh, I've been, you, you probably know some of this, but maybe your listeners don't, but I've been in Seattle for like 20, 20 plus years. I moved here in 2000. I was working for a, a, a music.com that got bought by Microsoft and I relocated here right kind of at the tail end of uh, Diesel Boy the first time. Uh, and we tried to do this many years ago, but geographically it was really challenging. Uh, and um, we made... We had like half a record written and we demoed it and uh but we just you know the geographic challenges and motivational challenges and it just never happened um and then over the pandemic greg and i were talking and we we wanted to give it another go but uh a couple of the you know og members either weren't able to do it or didn't want to do it we've all stayed friends but everybody you know everybody's just at different places in their lives or whatever so um yeah, made the decision to try and find some guys up here in Seattle. So three of us are in Seattle. Uh, Greg, a uh, bass player from the old days, is in California. Um, I don't know what I don't know whether you guys have similar geographic challenges, but it's gotten a lot easier, you know, since the last time we tried this, just in technology and being able to demo and send stuff around. And so, um, you know, uh, gratefully we were able to get it together. So there's a lot of us sort of practicing without Greg and getting the record together and he would learn from demos and then he'd come up, we'd all play together. And then, yeah, we made the record in, I think 20, I don't know, two weeks to 20 ish days, something like that. Um, and it was a blast to be in the studio again and making a record. So that's kind of how it came together. Yeah, man. I mean, we could go anywhere with this, you know, so feel free to steer me, but, um, yeah, you know, you guys started in 93 
then you your last record out was Road Hard, Put Away Wet, right? Is that the last one yep. you guys released? So that's yep. 2001, and then you guys kind of didn't do anything after that. It, it or was it was it 2001 or was it later than that that you guys were you guys were playing for a while? But um, yeah, I'm just I trying to get up the... here, and the the record came out, and uh, we did some touring, um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. There was you know I think uh, we'd been doing it for you know, I don't know, eight or nine years living on the road and making records and being in that cycle. And um, I don't know, it just, uh, there was never a calculated decision to stop. I got this job, I guess I had, you know, I had a fear that I was going to be the age that I am now and not have any other skills other than singing in a punk rock band. And, you know, I, I, I craved stability and, you know, it's just, you know, it, it, it was a blast, but, um, but the lifestyle was hard. Um, and, uh, and, and so I took this job and we, I thought maybe we could do both things. And we tried for a while, like I'd take my vacation and we'd go tour Europe. Uh, and then there was, you know, other members were having some personal issues and it just sort of, you know, there wasn't a, we never had a band meeting. There was never any talk of let's stop doing this. It just kind of, it just kind of stopped. You know, I think we were yeah. also at the point where it had kind of plateaued. Like we could have stayed a medium sized punk rock band forever, maybe, but you know, was that going to be enough? Is that what we wanted? I, I don't know. It seemed like, you know, maybe it had just kind of run its course. Yeah. Um, we'd done it. We had surpassed any expectations we ever had about being a band and, you know, we traveled all over the world and we got to tour and make records and it was awesome. So um, that, that, yeah. that is awesome. I mean, you guys have done a ton and you have a bunch of records and, and you guys have so many songs and uh, I want to know, like, so when you're coming back together, are you, are you trying to fix things that were hard about it the first time or in the past, or are you kind of going, all right, I'm ready to, take the brunt of the the pain that is coming towards me. I know I'm going to be busier. I know I'm going to have to like grind harder. So which is it? Is it like, no, let's fix those things. And, you know, obviously geography is an issue, but you fix that except for, you know, Greg, right? So some things are fixed, but it seems like when you fix something, a new problem arises. So what has this time been like in that respect? Well, for starters, we're all, you know, 20 years older and, you know, just in a different life place. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know. I don't I don't think we have the idea. Let's fix whatever was wrong. I, I think we you know, I, I know we've all played in other bands here and there, some seriously, some not seriously. Um, and um you know, there's just some kind of magic that we all missed about when we get in the room and play together. And, and, you know, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, fans would check in, you know, labels would check in. There still seemed to be an appetite for diesel boy music out there. You know, the, 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 you know, the fans were, you know, still streaming the records like crazy. And, you know, it seemed like there was still an audience there. I don't know if it's, you know, it's probably not a ton of new fans, but the people that were around when we were going now have kids and are older and still listen to that music and still want stuff. So we knew there was an appetite. Like I said, labels had reached out and expressed interest and said, you know, if you guys ever get back together, we'd, we'd want to, you know, we, we would put out the record. And so we knew that if we did this, it would be somewhat easier than starting a new band or starting from scratch or doing something. There's already all the work we did all those years ago was already there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, when I was finding guys to join the band, I wanted guys who were, um, older, who had a sense of, you know, who had a job. We're, we're not going to tour full time. You know, the idea is to like do festivals and fly outs and just kind of pick and choose the stuff we want to do. Uh, we, we knew that we wanted to make a record as the platform for our comeback um and not just go play older songs so i i guess in putting the pieces together i had a i had a sense of what i was looking for it was a little hard to find you know guys who are older who aren't looking to get in the van and sort of live the dream but who are willing to put in the work and you know the financial rewards aren't going to be plentiful most likely you know we we're you know uh, again, you know, I think it, the idea was just to kind of add in a little sweetener to our lives. If we can, we knew that it'd be a lot of work to get it up and running. There's no infrastructure, right? We don't have a van. We don't have all the same gear. 
We don't have a manager. So it's been a lot of work to try to, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. You know, we're getting up, we're going to go to Europe for uh, eight shows uh, in August. And we've got a couple of shows coming up here to warm up uh, in July. Uh, so we're still figuring it out. Um, uh, so, I mean, that was, that was, I guess, the goal is let's just see if we can get this up and running and then sort of pick and choose the, the stuff we want to do. I don't think there was a, an effort necessarily to fix anything, but, you know, in 20 years, I think we're older and wiser and just in different places. And so that, that helps a lot. That actually, um, that's, and, and again, yeah. like, and again, like I said, you know, two of the guys from, from the old lineup, you know, uh, you know, uh, one of them has personal struggles and, you know, just wasn't really able to do it. And, you know, the other guy just doesn't have interest and that's fine. We're all friends. It's, it's all good. So, you know, that, that kind of helps too. Just having everyone in a place where they want to do it and have this be a part of their life is great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're going at it at the right angle and, and the sweetener, you know, the way you described that was perfect because, you know, not not everybody needs the exact same thing out of a band, you know, like not everybody's trying to conquer the world and go into arenas. Like MXPX isn't even trying to go into arenas. You know, we're, we're, we're doing everything we can, but we're not trying to go into arenas. You know, there's different applications and different things you should do if you want to do that. Right. And, uh, and I think the band as a sweetener is so real. It's so real. And so many, like if I wasn't doing this full time, I would still want to play music. Right. And so why wouldn't, the next person that also played music growing up. So that I love. And the fact that the fact that one, I guess, you know, I always see things as a problem, like, oh, how are we going to fix this? You know, but you're just seeing this as we are who we are. So let's, let's do that. You know, let's do that. You know, take the punk rock, take the songs like diesel boy definitely has a name. Like people know who diesel boy is and they may need a, a reminder, a refresher, which is obviously why I put out a new record, you know, but, um, so it can be a lot of different things for, for the different people, you know, that somebody that's just a, like you said, you know, fans from back in the day that have kids and a family now, um, that is a sweetener just to hear, Oh, there's a new diesel boy record, right? Mm -hmm. They never thought they were going to get one. So that I didn't think we were going to get one either. You know, frankly, for a long time, I didn't, you know, I wasn't, anti-diesel boy but i just didn't have interest i was like all right well that chapter's done and i don't need to revisit these songs and you know time marches on and you know things change and feelings change and it was like okay you know it's been really fun to be back in the basement we're not you know for for the first you know for the last year we were just working on the record and learning the songs from the new record and you know that's a completely different process than going back and listening to the old records and getting in the basement and playing the catalog. And I'm like, man, these songs are fun. These are good. This is great. You know, so uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I was, I was a little surprised that I wanted to do it again, frankly, because for a long time I just didn't. It just felt yeah. like, you know, okay, I'll do something different. I don't want to be bound by the rules of being in this kind of punk band or this kind of band, or, you know, I'll have more freedom if I make a solo record or have a different band. But, you know, uh, there's also something great about having that audience that, you know, wants this thing and to, you know, try and deliver that. So, you know, I, yeah. Uh, I think I, I'm, yeah. I'm surprised that I ended up back here too, but glad that I did. I'm glad that you did too. I mean, being in a band is so different than being a solo artist, you know, and I've never had the experience of being a solo artist without also having, you know, the band. So it's probably different, but, but it is different because these days, a lot of people will just make a record in their bedroom. They get signed, they blow up, then they have to, okay, I need a band, you know, like <laughs> let's get the band together. But how we grew up was just, you just find people around you that have similar interests and that's what happens. So, it's the most, or it's like the analog. Being in a band is the analog version of music, right? You kind of have to, you have to really do it. Yeah. But times have changed. So, okay, you have songs like Titty Twister, album titles like So Fucking Cool, So Fucking Cool. So uh -huh. I have to say that a couple times. What, what do you, what's the new record? You got a new record coming out July 28th. So it's, yep. it's later in summer. Um, the new song, I did listen to the new song, Bismarck. Yeah. Sounds so good. Like if you com don't compare the records, listen to your first record by itself. I'm just telling people advice. And then listen to the new record by itself because they sound so different. And, but they're both great. 
because if when I listen to your old stuff, it sounds fine. It's great. You know, they're, <clears throat> the way it needs to be. But man, the new record sounds obviously modern. It's big. It's in your face. It's like it's got it's got mixing and production and all that. But like, what are the songs about? Is there any any anything you could share? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a. Uh... Th thanks for thanks for saying it sounds good. Uh, one of the things you know we uh, we we made all of our couple of records with Ryan Green, who was, did a lot of the Fat Record stuff back in the day. Uh, and we you know when we talked about uh, what we wanted to do, uh, you know one of the things that we wanted to do was not make a kind of cookie cutter sounding pop punk record. Um, and it was produced by a guy named Matt Bayless, who's up here in Seattle, and he sort of cut his teeth with. Uh, engineering uh soundgarden records and pearl jam records and then you know sort of got his name as a producer doing these really heavy bands like mastodon and isis but his stuff sounds fucking amazing and we want we were really curious to see what he would do with the pop punk band and you know turns out you know he loves flexing his sort of pop sensibilities it was really fun to make the record and different approach than we'd done before you know not dramatically in in the the methods but just having a different producer you know mm -hmm. having made all of our records with the same guy it was you know uh, fun to have some, uh, you know, a, a different kind of spirit and creative process in there. Uh, I'm not answering the question that you asked. Uh, it's a little challenging. I find as I've gotten older that, um, you know, uh, in my younger days, I was always, you know, in some combination of having some sort of uh, immature romantic longing or having my heart broken by some girl that I had met or, you know, things didn't work out the way I wanted. So it was like an endless well of, you know, uh, being heartbroken or heart sick or, you know, some combination thereof. And I, I just turned yeah. 50 as a 50 year old <laughs> dude, you know, those kind of things uh, are not uh, happening right. know, uh, uh, in, in my life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank huge. you. Um, wow. So, uh, so, you know, I find that finding topics to write about can be a little bit more challenging, you know, trying to find stuff that, that makes sense. Um, you know, also it's a diesel boy record. So, I, I wanted to find uh, the right balance of kind of, um, uh, you know, humor, but, you know, uh, but, but, you know, some more serious kind of stuff too. Not that we're getting deep into politics or, you know, that, that's still not our bag, but there's a bunch, you know, one of the things that Diesel Boy has always done is, you know, there's a million pop culture references, you know, there's a, there's a song called Internet Girl about uh, having a partner who's more interested in the internet than, uh, th mm -hmm. than me, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, there are several songs, it's like, you know, you go, go on Wikipedia and find as many terms as you can about that kind of thing and throw them into the lyrics. There's the, the one of the singles is called The Finish Line with, with two ends uh, about going to Finland for the first time. And, you know, the, the research was like, you know, finding as many Finnish exports as I could. Okay, there's Angry Birds and there's Nokia and there's director Rennie Harlan and there's the Dudesons and there's the Hanoi Rocks and, you know, uh, so th there's plenty of songs that, you know, I, about half maybe fall into that kind of funny diesel boy yeah. category and the rest are more along the lines of Bismarck or, you know, maybe more about relationships, uh, but maybe a, a, a more mature take on, on that kind of thing. There, I'm divorced. There's a song about divorce. The next single called Dirty Dishes is about going through my, my divorce. So there's stuff like that too. Mm. Real life. I mean, that I think that's, yeah. that's what it is. Like when we when we start as songwriters, as children, you know, we're writing about a lot of that stuff, like you just talked about humor, funniness, and heart sickness, being in love, being in, you know, being heartbroken. And I, f I find the exact same thing. I, I, I relate to that exactly. Like, what do you write about now? It's like, I even used to write about politics that I knew nothing about. You know, it was just like a feeling. Uh -huh. It was an energy. It was like, I'm mad about this. All right, let's go. So, you know, it's like nowadays it is different. It's like, okay, I can't, you know, it's, you want to be stream of consciousness. You want to just put it out there, right? But you also want to be like, is that something a you know forty year old man would say or or what? You know, so it's a fine you may, line. You may find this to be true, but often as I'm writing, you know, I'm singing, you know, sort of gibberish. But sometimes phrases come out, and a lot, and I don't know where they come from. But sometimes that phrase or whatever I'm spitting out that goes with the mood of the melody and the changes, you know, can lead me to knowing what the song is going to be about less so on a with the humorous stuff but if it's something that you know is some kind of feeling or you know some emotion that i'm trying to convey sometimes the whatever comes out can lead me to you know well what what 
where did that come from? What is that? And uh, and you can kind of find your way, kind of like a dream. Mm -hmm. Sometimes dreams will, will do that. You know, I've also enjoy, you know, a lot of my favorite writers uh, will put themselves, you know, will sing from in the first person, but as a character. So there's a couple of songs on the record uh, that do that, where it's like, you know, I'm singing in first person, but, uh, but it's not me that the song is about. Right. Right. No, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the dreams that consciousness, stream of consciousness writing is probably kind of how I do it. You know, I, I do the same thing you do. I come up with a feeling or the melody. It's all about, for me, it's the melody and the way the sounds sound me singing. And then I have to find words that kind of fit that feeling. And if it doesn't, then I'm like, ah, oh, that's weird. So I'm like fitting things into my own ideas. Rather, you, you would think like people that maybe don't write would think, oh, you just sit down and you go, I'm going to write a song about a dog and a cat. They fall in love, they fall out of love, and it's going to be great, no problem. And that's how I write a song, you know. <laughs> but that's like, the last thing usually for me is what it's going to be about, you know. Like right. I'll have the melody and the words and some sense of something, and then I'm like, okay, well, now what? Let's tie this together somehow, <laughs> cryptic, even cryptically sometimes, you know. But I know everybody's a little different. Some people don't like to talk about what their songs are about. Um, and sometimes I don't like to talk about it, but but generally, I'm I, I kind of like it when people want to know a backstory on a song, because when you know a backstory, you're going to be more connected to that song. It's gonna you're gonna yeah, find but sometimes someone. it has nothing to do with it either. Sometimes you know it means yeah. whatever it means to someone, and that's not for you to say. You know, if it means something to someone and it conjures something, whether that was what you intended or not, then. You know, at a certain point, once it's out in the world, it sort of doesn't belong to you. I mean, it does as the author, but, you know, you're sort of giving it to the world. And, you know, that's that. I mean, you know, there's a a deeper conversation here. But, you know, that was the thing that I guess I find moving uh, or about part of wanting to come back is that, you know, those songs have a life. You when you make a record, you know, we made this record. It exists in the world forever now. Maybe Mm -hmm. it'll disappear off the streaming services, but you know, there was something that wasn't there before that exists now. It lives forever. Someone may find it in 50 years or 100 years. Maybe no one will. But, you know, you make this thing and it goes out there and what happens to it is out of your control. It just takes on its life and people can find meaning in it. You know, you must get these same, uh, you know, it used to be letters. Now it's DMs or whatever. But, you know, somebody DM'd uh, our Instagram account the other day to say, Hey, you know, oh, your She's My Queen song. I met my wife in 2001 and this was, uh, you know, this song was really important to me. And, she, you know, uh, I call her my Marilyn and she calls me her Joe DiMaggio. And, you know, it was like uh, it was a really sweet story. And it's like, you know, that just, you know, that's why you do it, you know, that's or that's why I do it yeah. anyway. So, that's it. You know? No, you're right. Yeah. That, that is it. And, and you know, I was having a conversation earlier with some, some of the team on that I work with. And like, we were just talking about, stories and and just how connect how to connect to people you know how people connect to things and you can connect in so many ways but for me it was always about am i am i going to change am i going to make somebody's day if i do this then i'm going to do it you know like try to think of my life like that like if there's a a yes or no decision and it has to do with somebody else if i can make somebody's day and I can pos- you know, and I can physically do it, and I have time to do it, or whatever. I'm gonna do that thing, whatever. Whether it's just walking up to the, I'll tell you an embarrassing story. And this mindset kind of got me in trouble because last night I walked into a bar. I was just having a beer with my friend. Literally last night this happened, and this guy. I walk up to the bar, and this guy looks at me, and he's like, his eyes are bugging out, right? He's like standing there. He isn't saying anything for like. I don't know, almost a full minute. And I'm just like, how you doing, man? And I just started, I'm like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be nice here. I'm going to be overly nice. And he's like telling his buddy, dude, look, look, you know, or whatever. I talked to the guy. He's, he was graduated like, you know, 10 years later than me at the same high school or whatever. Um, Then he, then I'm, I'm playing pool uh, a little bit later and he, he comes by and he's saying this or that. He's talking to me and I'm like, Hey, and we're about to be done. I'm like, cool, man. You want a picture? And then everything changes. And everything and instantly he was like, no, nah, man. You know, even if you were Dave Grohl, I wouldn't get a picture, blah, blah, blah. I don't need And he wouldn't stop talking about how 
you wanted me, you know, I, I don't need that. <laughs> Suddenly I, you're the asshole. I'm yeah. the asshole. Like I thought he, I thought I was cool enough to ask him to take, you know, and I was like, well, I just thought it would be, you know, a nice memory, you know, whatever. And I, I'm just like, what, <laughs> what happened here? Like, and later on I'm thinking, wait a minute, I walk up to this guy and his eyes are bugging out of his head about how cool it was to see me. And then now I'm the asshole because I asked him if he wanted a picture. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, that has nothing to do with you. That you, you, you know, that was uh, that was his ego yeah. responding or you know, something. I triggered you know? it though. It was a weird thing because it, yeah. it was just like that picture thing. It was like all of a sudden you're we're taking this into maybe oh you want this for social media or that or it's a weird psychological thing I think where people yeah. feel less than if it's I'm getting a selfie for my social media or whatever. But sure, who cares? Let's go. Yeah. Let's do it. So. I don't know why I said you obviously touched a nerve that you know I, this was a line he would never I would never take a picture with uh, you know no. someone I admire never yeah so I, I was that was a trip that's uh it's like so my my lesson to you is never be nice to people ever <laughs> great yeah <laughs> only kidding but uh you know hey it it's it is what it is I'm sorry I don't beat yourself up about uh, you know uh, getting rejected from the selfie. I think that was a, you know a kind, admirable thing, and you know fuck him for being a dick about it. I told myself you know that was a little bit of an ego, like it took me down a notch, and I was like I I maybe needed that, and at the same time I wasn't like oh I suck. I was like okay whatever, and I <laughs> I can laugh at myself, you know. Your heart was in the right place. You can't you know you can't know how someone's going to respond. I hear you though. You know it's a there is some. You know, it's a, it's a, you have to wear it more than I do. Uh, but, you know, I rarely have to wear that part of my personality anymore because, you know, I'm a sort of pri a private, have a, I'm a private citizen, but, you know, I have to gear up to get into that mode where I'm, you know, uh, out and about and schmoozing and doing all that stuff. And, uh, you know, back when Diesel Boy was touring last time, there weren't cell phones, you know, people wanted you to sign their t-shirt or sign their ticket. And I know it's going to be nothing but, you know, so, you know, selfies after the show or whatever. It's yeah. like, I'm going to have to get into the, figure out what poses I'm going to make and what I'm going to do with my lips and my hands and, you know, to, to pose for the pictures after the gigs or whatever. So I got to, got I, I, I'm out of practice. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we can go anywhere, but it was just, I was, I was taken aback because it's, it was in my hometown. I wasn't on tour or anything, but, um, but for the most part, I would say those those connections, those conversations, those one on one people seeing people in the airport, it's the best. It makes my day just as much as it would make their day. Um, so I guess you know it's like it, it's interesting to think of a super famous person and to think that's a human. That's like a person that has feelings. I mean, it's hard to think of that when like they're so rich and they're just constantly you know, on their yacht or whatever. I don't know. But, but, um, everybody really is just a person. And the well, don't you think that you think about it differently because you have some fame and you, you know, famous musicians or maybe other famous people, but doesn't it change your perspective a little from, you know, that high school kid that you were or whatever, and seeing somebody that you admire because you know, probably so many of, of those people, it, it, you know, when you're on the other side of it, I think it changes your, your perspective a little. Yeah, probably does. You're right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the thing is like, did you ever feel weird about being in a band? And cause band people like musicians technically want to be seen. They want to be heard yet. There is a little aspect to it. It's like, I want to be seen, but, but I don't want to act like, I don't want to act like I want to be seen. Right. You want to like act mm. cool. But if you look at Perry Farrell, like, you know, Jane's addiction, he wants to be, seen. he's so cool. Right. But he wants to be seen. And that's, mm. something's not cool about that, right? <laughs> so I guess my question is, or discussion is like, what was it like for you guys, you know, the borderline of I'm in a punk band versus, wow, people actually really like this music and they're, you know, they want my autograph. I think it's hard to, uh, you know, it's hard for me to view myself as that who uh, is worthy of admiring in that way. You know, uh, one of the things I always liked about punk rock is, you know, that there was, you know, the barrier between band and fan mm -hmm. is much less than it is other places. And, you know, when we got our start, at, at, just like you did, you know, 
other bands would host you somewhere or vice versa. You know, it was like, you know, we were all the same, you know, people were doing work for the scene and still like that, which is great. Uh, and it would always, uh, you know, uh, when, you know, we would get to the point where we were headlining and would get an encore. I always just made me embarrassed, you know, that we would leave and people would be young. It just seemed so silly. Uh, all of the, you know, that the pretense and all of that stuff, but I recognize that it's just sort of part of how it goes. And as I've gotten older, you can have, I can understand it. I understand that people are fans and, you know, I'm a fan too. Uh, um, of course. Uh, so uh, I think I've gotten a little more at ease with it as I've gotten older. It still makes me uncomfortable if someone is gushing about something, but, you know, I, I just try and be gracious and appreciate that, you know, uh, again, it's not, it's not up to me what my music is to somebody, you know, it's just, you know, my, yeah. all I can do is try and be kind and take it in and appreciative and grateful. And I'm all those things. I mean, what a lucky place to be to have an audience for my music or to still have people care about it after so long. I mean, man, it's, uh, it's awesome. And, you know, I have, a it, it's, uh, you know, I've spent the last 20 years being a professional and, you know, in, in other, uh, areas of my life. And, you know, it, it, it trips people out, you know, when you have, uh, you know, uh, you sort of, it will come up, I'll be like, oh yeah, my band just made a record and people are like, what? You know, it's, it's weird to, you know, wear both of those hats, you know, I sort of step between these two worlds and, you know, uh, yeah. it, it, it's, it trips people out. Yeah. Yeah. That is trippy. Like I, I have the same thing, but for other people, like fans, fans that have really high end jobs, like they're, you know, the head of ESPN marketing or yeah, you know, yeah. whatever. I'm like, what? Like, okay. All right. Uh, congratulations. You know, like <laughs> I'm just sitting here playing in a punk band, but, and I'm still playing in a punk band. Although, I mean, it's, it is a business. It's like, you know, you got to do things, but yeah. it's crazy. There's something about it though, too. Like, you know, the level of fame that you have, uh, and, and that, you know, MXPX is more famous than Diesel Boy. But we used to always say, like, you know, we're famous at the club and then we leave the club and nobody gives a shit. You go get gas and you get on the road and nobody knows who you are. Then right. you show up at the club and everyone wants to talk to you. But it's nice because it sort of turns off. You know, if you were like a real famous person, you don't get that. You know, you don't ever get that quiet or that privacy. You can't take your kids to the movies or, you know, go to the mall with your wife or, you know, whatever you do without, you know. Uh, so it's at least a blessing that you sort of get to experience both worlds. You get to be famous in your in your own environment, but then when you're out in the world, most people don't give a shit about you or who you are. You know? Yeah, you're right. Most well, of the time. No offense. Although, <laughs> although I went to the I went to the Tacoma Mall with my family one one time, and less than Jake was walking around. Like, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> <laughs> this was years ago, but that's yeah, funny. that's always awesome. Um, no, you're right. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a weird. I'm in a weird sort of like, I don't know what you call it, a, you know, bubble, the amount of fame that, that we get or whatever, but it is weird because we do have fans all over the world, yet I can absolutely travel anywhere and keep my head down and I'm fine. Like there's no paparazzi chasing me. And that's the thing is like, the more you learn about how the world really works, you kind of realize again, famous, it's like kind of a facade. It's like, you know, people are, are, are putting their best foot forward. You've talked, you know, we've probably, you've probably heard like people say, be your best self, right? Uh, cause you should be yourself, but you shouldn't be the worst part of yourself. The, the, the part that probably isn't wearing pants underneath the, the angle. I can't see it cause the camera, but, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like as a, as a public facing person, it almost forces me, or it doesn't force me, I guess, but like, I want to be my best self. I want to try to not be an asshole. I mean, we're yeah. all assholes sometimes. It's just the way it is. I mean, I, I sometimes I make my kid cry and I'm just like, I am, oh, I can't believe I did that. Like, okay. Uh, my intentions were pure, but you know, whatever. And there's a whole other level now with all the Me Too stuff. It's like you got to watch everything you say and you got to be extra careful. And, you know, like uh, there's a, that, you know, that was not an awareness that I had 20 years ago. That's you know? true. I mean, that's the thing is like, w w I, am I going to worry about the jokes I make? Not most of the time. I mean, if I'm on a lot, if I'm at a live show, I probably am. You know, I'm, I'm going to be like, but would I make a bad joke like that anyway? No, not, not, not really. Right. Um, but I, mean, but I think it speaks to what you're saying. There's some accountability. Not not only should not only should you do it because it's you know uh, uh, 
it's because it's it's good, I guess. But there's some accountability. It's like, right. well, if you don't watch your shit, everyone else is going to watch your shit. So, but do you think? Do you think? I mean, I'm sure, according to the woke mob, if you're like super left, I've everybody's probably done something in their lives that's cancelable, right? And, and I, I definitely probably have. And um, but that's the thing is like that's just such a tiny little po- percentage of the population. Most people aren't even thinking about let's be some let's get mad at something right now like i don't start my day about getting mad i don't want to get mad right who does some people i don't know i don't know about you. i don't you think, read the I, internet i don't think you do <laughs> but uh that's that's what it is it's like i really try to to take things on the internet especially with a grain of salt right because it's like these opinions feel so big when maybe they're just a few people just screaming you know, but it, on the internet, it's really hard to to tell what the the balance of actual outrage versus this is a headline or this is a thing that's kind of snowballed. But I, I love that you know, twenty years ago, you know, there was no social media, so when we last were making records and stuff, you couldn't sort of like be a fly on the wall about the discussions about your band. But I can go into you know any Facebook group and people are talking about the new single or our records or whatever, and you know you sort of snicker at you know you can. You know, it's all public. You're like, ah, people probably don't know that the band is reading it, or maybe they do, or maybe they don't care. Maybe that's the goal, but there's something voyeuristic about, you know, being able to watch these discussions, uh, you know, about, about stuff that's so personal to you without uh, without people knowing. And you're right, you do have to divorce yourself from it. In some, I can read a hundred good comments about the new song and there's one asshole who you know doesn't like it and that's the one that uh, they're not an asshole for not liking it the uh, <laughs> uh you know somebody expresses uh uh you know uh it's their opinion uh, yeah you know that, that in, in a way that you know sort of sticks in my craw or whatever and that's the one of course i remember it's the negativity honestly but y- you notice how like even bands that are have sad songs like they only sing negative sort of like heavy or like a lot of those people are still very positive when you talk to them They're nice people so so i don't understand seeing all this like i think it's just heavily weighted like you that 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 negativity does get a bigger reaction right so if you're the guy that wants to troll everybody on the on the comments you're going to say the contrary thing which that's a tactic sure. right so i kind of i'm trying to see things less emotional and more like okay yeah that person that person whatever yeah it's like it's hard it, it, that's been a challenge just in general and getting the band going again is getting my ego uh out of the way a little bit you know i see like oh well how come we didn't get asked to play this festival or how come this thing didn't happen or why didn't you know i gotta just you know i can't have fomo i have to just enjoy the work and enjoy the process and enjoy what happens and that you know that all of that stuff just gets in the way and just doesn't feel good yeah, can I can I just mention, just comment on on your comment about FOMO? I mean, that's so real. Like, there's going to be a lot of people listening to this that are trying to get their band going, trying to get their business or their project. Maybe you have a cleaning business, but you're across town. There's a business that's also a cleaning business that has social media posts every day, and you're just like, I can't get my thing going, and people aren't paying attention to my thing. For us bands, it's like, okay, they're on this great tour, they're playing this festival. You're just like, man, I wish I was out there doing that. But you have to focus on what you're doing. You have to put the best of you into your thing. And there is time, and it's, it's all about timing, you know? And so you have to work your way into those situations to where you're posting and you're at the festivals and you're doing that and this. And, um, but it's so easy to get discouraged and not think of all that and think, okay, they did their, their build up to get to there. There was a lot of work that went into all of that, right? And so I just try it. And, it, and it happens to me. I'll be looking online, see, oh, Less Than Jake's, they're out there again, oh, cool, you know, whatever. But, like, I know what we do is valid. I know people want to see it, and people will. And so it's like that I hope people can understand, like, FOMO is a real thing, but it's also, it's also just, like, mostly smoke and mirrors. You know, you're seeing the best pictures. You're seeing the best videos from wherever, you know, and you know, the, the real work is happening off camera. The world, you know, you're, we're grinding, we're, we're texting people, we're calling people, we're writing something out, whatever it is. We're it, it, half the, most of the time it's not even writing a song, to be honest. Like most of the work is 
telling people, connecting with people, talking to people. It's all about people. I wish I would have known that when I was when I was younger. Mm. Definitely, but I think I've done it right. But yeah, yeah. and I think you know uh, the bands that don't have person or people in them, you know, will struggle because it's important. You know, all of that stuff that you're saying is important. You know, maybe you get a manager that can do some of that, but you know, you got to have. You're right. It's a mix of of all that stuff. You gotta you gotta have that hustle, but you gotta be personable, and you gotta be charming, and you gotta be able to sort of you know uh, kiss babies and shake hands, and you know all all, all that stuff. Um, and somewhere, you know, despite your FOMO, you know somebody is seeing you know your latest record or your tour, and you know is feeling that same sense of FOMO. So it goes both ways. You know, there's plenty of stuff. I'm sure, you know, oh. We Diesel Boys got a new record out. Some band is, you know, mad that, you know, whoa, whatever. So it's all yeah. perspective. Mm-hmm. I just, I really just want it to be, you know, I just don't want to feel bad. I want it to be a positive experience. And I, like I said, it's that sweetener. I want it to, to add, you know, uh, add uh, something into my life that was, you know, m- missing. Yeah. That is missing. You know, that the ability to flex that creative muscle and have an audience for it. And, you know, that's enough. And and from the beginning of the rebirth, you know that that was the goal. So I, it's, but I just gotta. It's good to remind myself to you know keep that in mind, and you know it. But it's it's challenging, you know. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it's nice that you don't have to pay the bills. You don't have to stress about that part. So it's just all yep. about what you care about. You know, what you care about is is you want to do well. You want to have a good experience. You know, you want the guys with you to also kind of have that experience. It's like, you know what can happen and probably what will happen, but it's never guaranteed. And that's what's stressful maybe about even the good things, right? It's mm. like, this is so good. I don't want it to end. That's stressful. So like, no matter what, right? <laughs> totally. <clears throat> uh, yeah. There's also, you know, it's a whole new world. Like, you know, my kids are freshmen and I've got twin, identical twin boys. They're freshmen in high school. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've never seen me play. They've never seen this whole uh, p- part of my life. So, I, you know, it, 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 it'll be fun to get to show that to them too. Uh, you know, we don't, they're, they're not interested in punk rock really because uh, of, of course they're not because uh, they're <laughs> of course know, not. D- dumb dad uh, does it. You know, I've got this, uh, you know, I've got a room full of records and, you know, uh, have a fantasy that they're going to go out there and just think my records are amazing, but they have zero uh, interest in any of that stuff but um you know occasionally a, a friend's band will will come and I, I brought them to see uh it was bowling for soup and real big fish um and uh you know they hadn't been to a concert and it was like you know we're we're backstage and they're talking to the band and we're you know they're drinking sodas from the you know from from the dressing room and they're watching from the side of the stage and we got to go on the bus and you know uh they were like wow this is amazing like going to concerts is amazing and i was like eh, this is, <laughs> don't get used to it this is not how you know this is probably the only time you'll ever get to watch a show like this so uh, don't, don't get used to it and it is amazing but yeah that yeah that is cool man i mean because you don't usually get to talk to the singer of the band right before he walks up on stage and to, you know uh all that stuff absolutely so, yeah. absolutely it, it, that that's wonderful. I can't wait. I can't wait for my kids have not seen us play either, but there's all like there's been a couple times it just hasn't happened. So I'm 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 looking forward to hopefully this year. Actually, we're doing some shows. They might come to. So, how old are your kids? I have uh, almost an almost seven year old my boy, and then a ten year old girl. So okay. yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's the 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 sweet years you know it's it's awesome do they like your music or do they think what you do is cool they do they think i'm a rock star but they they really have no bearing they have no like real understanding they, of it you know they it's think like, that because that because because people sometimes talk to you in public or because that's just sort of what what your job is to them it's what my job is i mean people do talk to me in public sometimes but yeah it's mo- it's it's mostly just like yeah i got to go do this this show and when we were putting on our, our last record, the self-titled, I was showing them a bunch of the videos and stuff on the computer, and, and they are like, whoa, this is crazy. And, um, 
you know, that was when they were really into it, when they are kind of real little kids. Now they're, you know, they've gotten into Roblox and, and all this stuff. They still like the band, but they don't necessarily like, listen to it. I, I'm thinking when we put out our new album, we'll just get them back into the punk rock cycle. But I think seeing your dad, like, on a stage with all these people cheering, I mean, that is just a perspective that, as a kid, like, I cannot imagine my father, like, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe it... it Maybe it won't be weird, but I have to imagine like the first time your kids see, you know, you or, you know, on a stage with all these people screaming. I mean, that's a that is a weird thing, you know, no yeah. other. That is just, a, you know, it kind of a, freaks a me a out. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. It freaks me out. Do you get nervous when you go on stage? been so long uh <laughs> you don't know, you know i mean i mean i you know played with my last band you know you, you know small shows but uh yeah i mean i think i'll be nervous you know we i yeah i'm sure i will be and i'll for sure be nervous if my kids are there i'll be way more self-conscious oh just, yeah you know thinking about what what i'm saying and you know not that they don't know who i am or that they haven't heard whatever these things are but you know to have to like they don't see me as diesel dave or in that you know where i'm like on and performing you know i'm just like you know eh, can you guys pick up the crap on the floor yeah you know, eh, you know, whatever you <laughs> yes. know uh, do your homework uh so but yeah i think I'll, i think i'll probably be nervous i think yeah. uh, i did you know the 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 most re you know like i don't know how long ago it was at this point seven eight years ago may maybe i went and did uh i went to australia and played solo acoustic which i'd never done mm. um and uh, and that was terrifying being on stage with j nobody else, no band, just an acoustic guitar and a microphone. Like the first three shows, like I I just hardly remember. It was a uh, it was part of this festival, so there was a bunch of full bands and then acoustic acts in between. Um, and that, some of the shows were big. Yeah, was that um, Soundwave or no? No, it was no, called somehow. Hits and Pits. Oh, Hits and Pits. Um, okay. Um, and uh yeah the year that i i was there it was G good ridden so wilhelm scream voodoo glow skulls um i'm probably forgetting forgetting some of the bands uh but that was right. you know I, yeah. that took me that took me a couple of shows to just kind of like even be present because i was just so nervous yeah um it's all different thing but then after you know after i was done like you know i was like backstage patting myself on the back. I just entertained a room full of people all by myself, you know, go, go me, you know, it's empowering when yeah. you, you know, just you, uh, but you know, there's nobody to look at if you make a mistake or, you know, there's just, it's just you. It's a very, uh, a very vulnerable, uh, feeling for, if I had to describe that feeling for people that haven't been on stage or something like that, it would be like, and maybe you haven't bungee jumped either, but it'd be like bungee jumping. It'd be like when you're about to get to the top, like really high up, and you're just, you just have to jump. And you know you're probably going to be fine, but there's a slight chance you'll die. I think that's going on stage. You're probably going to be fine, but there's that slight chance you'll die. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> I have a recurring dream. It's always a little different, but I'm always on stage and I either don't know the chords or the lyrics, uh, you know, evaporate from my head. Like I, I have this dream regularly, you know, not just in, even before diesel boy was, you know, sort of coming back, but you know, there's just some, you know, powerlessness or inadequacy feelings in these dreams where you're, you know, there's all these people staring at you and you just have no fucking idea what to do or what you're going to do. It's a horrible, I'm always so grateful to wake up and be like, ah, yeah, absolutely. No, that that is that's. I once terrifying. wrote a story. You know, for a while I was writing for Seattle Weekly, and um, you know, I had had a I had had a a thing with my last band where I was on stage, and the lyrics literally just evaporated from my brain. You know, there's a song that I wrote. I wrote the lyrics. We played it a million times, but they were just gone. You know, I get to the next verse, I have no idea what is supposed to be there. And so I wrote this piece about the experience and I talked to like a, a neurologist at the University of Washington to try and understand like why that happens or, you know, what, what, yeah. how do you, how can you avoid that? It was interesting, you know? Uh, what did they say? <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly. It was a few years ago, but you know, the hints that they gave were like, well, you can put some prompts around the stage. Like it's a normal sort of flight or fight. It's a, it's a response to nerves or to, you know, be in an adrenaline situation, like one of the things that your brain does is it just the synapses just that connect those things just go away. And if you try and think about it, it's worse. Like the way to sort of get yourself back there is to try and just, you know, 
stop thinking about it. Yeah. And, and the advice was like, well, if you can tape up, you know, if there's spots, you know, that are going to be problematic, you know, you tape up the lyrics or some prompt, you know, on the stage or, you know, there's things that you could do to, to remind yourself, but the worst thing you can do is to sort of panic about it. And, and you know, in that situation, I'm sure you've had this happen, but you know, you sort of mumble your way through and then you get to the chorus and you know, you're fine or, yeah. just, you know, you sort of snap back into it, but it's fascinating that, you know, something that I know better than anything else uh, goes away. And even, you know, 20 years on, as we're in the basement learning these songs from records that came out in the nineties that I haven't sung in years and years, that are just in there. Mm -hmm. They just are, the lyrics are there. My hands kind of know where to go. It's amazing that the muscle memory and the, and the, even the lyric memory. Yeah, it is. I mean, it happens to everybody. I, I would say, I, I don't know anybody that it hasn't happened to, but like, I feel like the same way, like, a song that I'll have played a million times, there's like, I'll have a sticking point. Like this one line, I'll keep screwing it up over and over and over. I'm like, and I'm even trying to like fix it and then I'll fix it. And then if I don't think about it, I screw it up again. So it becomes actually what your brain mm. thinks is right when you screw it up too many times. It's like so annoying, so frustrating. But uh, I really have to work at some of that stuff of making sure my thought process is focused on certain things to get those lyrics right. There's too many lyrics, but like, Going on auto is the way to go. So if you're just automatically singing, but if you change it up, something changes, or if you think about something and you miss your cue or whatever it is, that's where I get into trouble. Like trying to come back and jump back into something is really hard for me. Like once I'm past it, right? It's like, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> we'll catch it, catch it next time around. And when you've at least, if you know, the going back to being the only one on stage with an acoustic guitar, like God forbid that happens, at least, you know, when you're on stage with your band, the other guys can fill in the space and, you know, you can just sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's not as painful. Absolutely. Or not as noticeable. Absolutely. You can, with a band, I mean, you get away with so much. You can be like, all right, let's break it down <laughs> and just be like, all right, <laughs> you know, just change it up, rest, think about your line. You know, whatever, you, you know, but with an acoustic guitar, like you said, you're, I think it's just a, a muscle that you really have to work. Like you said, it took you like three shows to even start remembering and being in the present moment. To me, being a stand-up comic is like the most like impressive feat uh, of performance, like you and a microphone, at least a guitar, like you're kind of singing, but like there's something about like, man, I got a lot of respect for stand up comedians just to get up on stage with a microphone and just to be able to talk. It's, it's awesome. It's fascinating to me, you know, as somebody that really like sits down and writes songs out. I feel like my pace of thought doesn't have to be as quick, you know, then. And, and now you have like these freestyle rappers and it's a different style for sure. It's like, man, I, I should probably learn how to do that better too. But, but, uh, but for me, I just feel like I feel so dumb when it comes to quick, quick, you know, I need to, to say something funny here. Right. Mm. But I feel fine when it comes to songwriting. Like, oh, okay, I know what to say. I can say this. I can say, you know, whatever. Maybe I change it up. I don't want to say this anymore. But like, yeah, I mean, even on this podcast, there's no edits. So whatever we say, I mean, sure, if you really want to edit, I can edit it. But it's going to be as is, right? And so do I then freak out and go, oh, I better really, really overthink. I better speak like Obama very slowly i don't want to do that either so i just kind of like find a middle ground okay i am what i am i'm gonna be myself i'm gonna to try to be somewhat coherent in my speaking which which if we weren't talking right now i'd probably just be drooling in a corner but you know i just wake up I'm like, okay let's do this podcast all right let's <laughs> i don't know what my point is i'm sorry <laughs> That's all right. I think, you know, uh, I, I definitely prefer the podcasts that are more of a conversation where, you know, you can just kind of shoot the shit versus, you know, uh, and, you know, I think uh, I've been on uh, on the other end, too. Like I said, I was a writer for a long time and interviewed bands and did a lot of that. The best thing you can do is just do your homework and, you know, be yourself and, it, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. For sure. Of course. I mean, you know, you've been interviewed so many times, you know what it's like to sit and be on the other end of some nervous interviewer where, you know, there's like no vibe and it's just, you know, they're sort of fumbling their way through the questions. Like it's always just such a relief to, you know, have a 
pleasant conversation. Yeah. And and that's kind of why I don't even like write down questions. You know, I just, I have a a few ideas of what we're maybe going to talk about and that's literally it. And so, you know, as long as I know there's a new record coming July 28th, you know, things like that. (laughs) Everything else is just us talking, you know, because I, you know, it's hard to describe what this podcast even is. It's obviously about music most of the time. It, I love talking to other artists, other band guys, other or ladies, uh, about just what it is they go through. Because it's all kind of similar, but we all have our own journey and our own way of dealing with it. And so I love hearing about that. You yeah. Know? And just being real and not trying to be like, okay, we're perfect. Cool. Enjoy, yeah, everybody. You got to be... And, you know, there's like you said, you're interested in it. So that's the key. If you can, if you're interested, you're, you know, whatever your nose will lead you to the right place for the conversation. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask you this, by the way, being a writer, I mean, sure, I'm a writer, but I'm not really a writer. Like I don't get paid. I get, I get paid to do, sell some t-shirts, right? Like we sell t-shirts, we sell tickets, but like what, what was it like to become a writer? Do you ever feel, do you ever feel like you're good enough? Like, like it's gotta be so hard because it's so subjective, right? Correct. Sorry. I keep saying right. Correct. Uh, yeah. I mean, I never set out to be that. Um, and I am not formally trained to do that. Um, you know, I, I had a, uh, job that allowed me to, um, you know, just as a byproduct of the work, I began interviewing a lot of artists, you know, musicians, but also actors and then writing about it. And, um, and then, uh, part of my job was managing a team of other writers and being their editor. Um, and, um, that led to other things. And, you know, for many years while the Seattle weekly was still publishing, I wrote about music for them. And, um, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a different hat, you know, there's, uh, definitely different from writing songs. Um, it's challenging. Um, uh, I guess I tried not to think too much about, you know, uh, am I good at this? Am I good enough? I mean, I was getting paid for it. I mean, the, although the pay is, uh, piddly, you know, may, maybe not quite as bad as the music streaming services, but, but not too far <laughs> off. Right. Uh, but, but, um, but, you know, I did it because, because I enjoyed it. I don't know. It's just a different, you know, uh, different muscle. I miss it. I don't get to do m- much of it anymore. I mean, I sort of, uh, I, I still write sort of professionally, but not, uh, not covering entertainment stuff and not, okay. not doing music writing. I think it's also tricky. Um, you know, the, the band wasn't actively going then, but I think it, it can be tricky to be both a critic and an artist at the same time. You sort of leave yourself open to, you know, to, to, to that. Um, and I don't, you know, I never, I still don't really mind. I don't mind getting a bad review as long as it feels like there's some critical heft behind it. You know, I always, I didn't enjoy the reviews that were just kind of pure opinion, but that didn't, there was kind of no reasoning. It was, I don't like this or this is something, but you know, give me some reason. You might be able to convince me that, you know, our new single is bad, but you know, tell me why it's bad or what's not good about it. Or, you know, like I just want some critical, critical thinking so uh, and, and I, but i enjoyed that but 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 you know but it does kind of leave you vulnerable if you're yeah. making art and cr- criticizing art at the of same course, time of course of course do you i mean do you, i'm just trying to think of like when you write a song you're not thinking of a critic you're not thinking of what other people are going to think mm. not necessarily but you're just taking well not directly but at the same time uh i'm I'm guessing you can relate to this. Uh, you know, you want, you have to be challenged by it. It has to be interesting enough for you to want to work on it. And so for me, I don't want to feel like I'm repeating myself or I need to, you know, find something that is interesting enough to me. I, I'm not thinking about other people necessarily. Um, but there's that inner critic in me yeah. that, uh, is censoring you know, ah, eh, that's generic or that's not exciting or, you know, ah, eh, you know, like there's a couple of songs on the new record that use a capo, like, eh, is, I don't know, it's not, maybe not be fun live, but, you know, when I'm sitting with my acoustic guitar, at least if I've got the capo on, I can play open chords and they sound different or, it's, you know, it stimulates me in a different kind of way. So I guess there's, 
an inner critic in my head, maybe more than the, you know, I, yeah. I'm not thinking about the people reviewing the record, but I, I do want to make something that I think our fans will like. Um, but I also have to like it too. You know, I, I have both things. I have to service both parts or it won't feel authentic to me in some way. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Uh, so Bismarck, speaking of, yeah. you know, the latest song that people can hear, um, that came out, what, I don't know, just came out pretty recently, right? Or That yeah, came out, yeah, last month or something, a couple weeks ago. Sweet. And then the next single comes out on Friday, and then there's, uh, there'll be three singles before the record comes out. Okay, so people will be able to hear more music by the time this comes out. I, it'll, yep. I don't know exactly when it'll be out, but um, yeah, I mean... And pre-sale for the records up, so if anybody wants to get uh, a copy of the... the triumphant return of diesel boy gets old the record is called um diesel boy gets old uh that must have been uh, a conversation pre- do we call it gets old what are the you know you know it's hard it's hard to come up with a record title and um uh or at least it, it is for us and it was like well all of our other ones had these kind of puns and you know this one also has a pun you know you could say well listening to diesel boy gets old mm-hmm. but we've also gotten old um so you know, I think it was, uh, we like the title, but, you know, uh, a lot of times what you end up with is like, well, we don't all hate it. You know, <laughs> did, did we find one that we all love? No, we didn't find one of those either. But sometimes right. it's like, you just said that, well, you know, it was one that we all, none of us said like, no, no. Yeah. So, uh, and you wanted yeah. to somewhat tell a story or come, you know, have something to do with the out, you know, the, the songs or whatever. So the next album yeah. is going to be gets older and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. But then, but then what? But then what? Then, geez. Gets old. No, nothing good. <laughs> Diesel boy's dead. Yeah, it'd be like the post humus post. I don't know if I'm saying that right. You know what I'm saying? Posthumous. 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 Post- posthumous. Edit. Post- edit me, please. Edit me, Dave. <laughs> I bet you get get fans. Edit me, Dave. Edit me. Hmm. Sorry, that was my favorite. Inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, well, everybody, go check out the the new songs. Um, find it anywhere you stream your favorite music. Diesel Boy. Make sure you guys put a space in Diesel Boy. It's not one word; it's two words. I'm correct. Yeah, or, on else, that. You'll, or else you'll be listening to uh, the uh, long running drum and bass DJ with the with the same name. Yes, we tried uh, when we were you know when we first got signed. You have to your due diligence, our lawyer or whatever did the research and, you know, found, Oh, there's this drum and bass DJ in Pennsylvania. He wasn't anything at the time, either were we, uh, but neither of us had enough. He had owned it longer in his home state. So could have claimed, you know, uh, could have claimed it in Pennsylvania or wherever he's from. I think it's Pennsylvania. Uh, so we both agreed to just sort of like it coexist. Uh, there you go. It has it created problems over the years sometimes, but you know, it's kind of funny. I, I, we, I wanted, I've always wanted to do like a, a diesel boy versus diesel boy record. Um, gratefully there's not a much crossover between drum and bass and pop punk, but there must be some, uh, but yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. There must be some, we even had a little crossover not crossover, but we had a DJ in Indonesia or somewhere like Southeast Asia, might have been Malaysia, and they were called DJ MX or MXPX mm. or something. Maybe it was even DJ MXPX. And for a while, I don't know what happened. I think they changed he their name. He shoot his ass, and now he's out of it. No, I, they were, they, I would just see their posts. I'm like, <laughs> I'm following MXPX, and I'm seeing these posts. But maybe somebody had them killed. I, not me. I would never do that. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> but yes. Uh, space between the words otherwise you'll find yourself on the drum and bass dj who's still out there good for him i think he maybe he's slowed down over the years too but surprisingly he's you know he seems to also still be at it so hey, you know godspeed we, good we, for you we want all diesel boys to do well of course that, absolutely there's another diesel dave too i think there's like some reality show star uh who also goes by diesel dave so hmm. uh, i got i got him now to deal with also Hey, it's no good. trademark on Diesel Dave. It's good to get get that out there. At least people listening will be like, okay, I won't be as confused when I'm looking for it or whatever. But that's good, dude. You'll find us. Yeah, we'll find you. I found you very easily. It was it was not hard, people. I realized they do not sound like this. This is not the drum and bass thing that I remember. So no, it was, it was easy. <laughs> Where's the singing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this new stuff is is different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so fucking cool though. It really is. 
Um, anyway, sorry, I had to work that back in. All right, Dave Lake, everybody, we'll wrap it up. Where do you want people to, to go, like website or socials or, or anything like that? Yeah, diesel-boy.com is the website, and there's links to uh, all of our stuff there, Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, merch, the new record, pre-order, all of it. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Dude, excited. Thank you for taking the time, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was great to see you. Good talk. All right, yeah. hit me up anytime. That was awesome. Thanks so much to my guest, Dave Lake. Diesel Boy, the new album comes July 28th. So that might, by the time you're listening to this, who knows? Maybe it's already out. So go check it out. Anywhere you find uh, your music, you'll find Diesel Boy. And it's Diesel uh, Diesel Space Boy. There's no one word. It's not one word. So just remember that when you're looking. All right, you guys. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Shout out to Bob McKnight. Check out his podcast, The Bob and Katie Show. They get into some pretty pretty interesting stuff over there. Anyway, uh, if you want to call, the number is 360-830-6660, mxpx.com for all of your needs. Uh, we might s start selling just about everything on there. So no matter what you need, we'll have it. That's not quite ready, but, but it's coming. <laughs> all right, you guys. Peace.